really doesn't need an introduction because for those of you who have been with New Covenant for a long time, Lynn Cartwright has been one of the missionaries that we supported right from the very beginning. I don't know if you were the first one that we picked up with, but you were right up there. A long time ago. Long time ago. And her and her husband established uh, missions out in the Southwest, and we've had people here that are still part of New Covenant that have been out there to work with you guys, and some of you I know have been out there before with, with the work that they do, and she was in town this week, and so we've invited her to come in and share a little bit. It's been a couple of years since you've been with us. Uh, more than a couple. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm going to let you introduce the entourage that you have with you today, because some, some of them we've seen before, some we've not. So I'll let you do that. But uh, without further ado, uh, give me just a second, because we want to have a recording of this as well. So give me a second. Oh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I used to be very sensitive about being recorded. <laughs> uh, when you make mistakes and people keep them. <laughs> Are you ready? All right. I'd, uh, I'd like, first of all, to ask my son, Brian, to stand. Uh, this is Brian. He is the uh, president of our organization now. My husband, Don, his dad, went to be with the Lord this year. And his wife, Patty, uh, Patty does not speak English. So if you talk to her and she doesn't understand, talk back in Spanish. <laughs> and uh, their son, Braden, my grandson, would you stand? He speaks both languages. He's very, very fluent, and he's my translator for his mama. All right. You may be seated in Larissa. This is our daughter, Larissa, and I think every time we've been here, she's been here as well. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, I'd like to ask you to turn, well, you know, we are from old school, and we do use computers uh, somewhat, but at my age, I am still using the book. So, if you would like to turn with me to Second Chronicles, uh, chapter 20, and I'd like to ask you to stand with me for the reading of the word. In our Navajo churches, in the summertime, you come into church at a certain time, and in the winter, it's different. You come to church, and the people are not as apt to be looking at clocks. Sometimes church lasts six hours or more. But uh, we finally got used to the idea that if it's winter time, it might be 5.30 or 6 o'clock because we're starting right at just about as it gets dark. And in the summertime, it might be 9 o'clock or later uh, before church starts. And it might be 3 o'clock in the morning before it closes. So it's a little different. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's read in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20. And if I were reading this at home... It would take twice as long, and maybe that's why the long services, because many people don't speak English. Navajo is a very difficult language, and I, I may say one sentence, and they translate it, and the translation may take ten sentences. So it's, uh, the language is incredibly difficult. Some of you may have heard about Navajo code talkers from back in the wars when they really rescued uh, our military because the Japanese could not break the code that was made from the Navajo language. So, All right, let us read. After this, one more thing. I may not say all these words and names the way you're familiar with them. Okay. 
After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Meunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They're already at Hazaz on Tamar. This was another name for En Gedi. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard of the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestor, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not... Give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham. Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we're faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us, and now... See what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that's about to attack us. We don't know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. As the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Madaniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You'll find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the battle. That opens into the wilderness of Jeruel, but you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Let us pray. Father, we stand before you, all of us, and you know our hearts. You know where we are. You know where we're going to be. We know where we've been. But we surrender our hearts, our lives, our living, all of our loved ones, everything about us, work, business, school, whatever, it's in your hands. We pray for your directions, your leadership. We know that you answer prayer, and we pray that you will help us to faithfully carry out your instructions for us. In the name of Jesus, we bind Satan and command him and his forces to leave us, not to trouble anyone here or any of our loved ones. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we have never quite learned to think of ourselves as missionaries. And many years ago, back in the 70s, we felt a call of the Lord to do something, and we weren't sure what we could do. And we heard about a ministry some of you maybe are old enough to remember what a christian coffee house was uh many of you probably never heard of that but we knew a lot of people who never had really living in the united states of america but never really heard that much about how to minister to people and we had all these 
denominations, which were wonderful, but every denomination was, we're the right ones. You know, we do it well. We, uh, we let our ladies wear earrings at our church. Oh, and our church, no, that's a terrible sin. You're going to go to uh, be with Satan forever for that. We, uh, some, uh, we had one pastor who uh, in the 70s had a yardstick by the door to measure the girl's skirts, see if they were long enough to allow them to come in. That, and, and they would come, and when they saw that, they would turn around and not go back in. But what we were trying to do, we were in the Ohio, central Ohio area, and we had friends who went downtown into the Ohio State University where on Friday and Saturday night, there were hundreds and hundreds of people, and some of them were high and wild. We had a, a couple who were ministers in a drug rehab. It was not connected to the university. Uh, it was something they set up there to see who they could help. And if you were really caught up in uh, major addiction, you could move into that place and they would pray with you and get the word of God in you, do everything they could until uh, you were set free and given your heart to the Lord. So they invited us to come and sing on the street. And, and, and when you got there, I had three little children at the time, and we had a station wagon, and, but we were instructed to be there at midnight. So we had not experienced that kind of thing before, and we went uh, into that area downtown, and there were thousands of people, strange people, wandering around there. So we put the boys on the seats in the car and told them to go to sleep and locked the doors. And we started singing, and the people who ran the drug rehab started preaching. And there was a man who had some kind of a cape on and no shirt, and his uh, we did a lot of weird hair back then. But the minister's wife was talking to the people, telling them how to give their hearts to Jesus. And this man walked up to her. Do you know what a switchblade is? Is this the wrong generation? Okay, right generation. Uh, he pulled out a switchblade, put it right here. Everybody knew that she was gone. But he popped the blade at her throat. And she just looked at him, and she said, in the name of Jesus, drop it. And it just fell on the ground. And then people began to listen to what they had to say and give their hearts to the Lord. Well, we thought, I don't have that. <laughs> you know, that knife pops at me. I don't know what I'm going to do. But we, we began to pray and say, God, what do you want us to do? And we started a... A ministry on the street that was all we did. We were not experts in the word of God. I grew up in a Christian home, thank God, and, and uh, knew a lot less than I do now and still need to know a lot. But at that particular time, uh, we were in between two bars and anybody walking down the street in this town could walk in and sit down at a table and listen to gospel groups sing different styles and have a cup of coffee and a sandwich for free. And you could stay five minutes or five hours, whatever you wanted to do. And we were almost immediately invited to do prison ministry. And within a matter of three or four months, became the county chaplains in an old prison that was uh, five stories high. There was a basement with a kitchen where the deputies all came in and had their coffee and their food. But the prisoners got bologna sandwiches three times a day. 
and there were three major metal doors in between us. We, we went in and uh, tried to find a way to minister, and they could barely hear us. And, but we eventually, they started just locking us back in with the prisoners, and God protected us and helped us in ways I don't have time to tell you about today. But we started praying, and we said, Lord, uh, yeah, we're, we're doing all we kind of know how to do. We had a, a singing groups, and we were invited to go into state and federal prisons and so forth. And one day we said, God, is there something you want us to do that we're not doing? There were about, I don't know, 25 or 30 of us at the time involved in the ministries, and none of us had any confidence. We just trembled and said, Lord, show us what to do. We don't know what to do. And uh, one night, one Wednesday night, a man came to our church as a speaker. He'd been a missionary overseas, and that country was war-torn, and they'd shut down the missions and send them home. And, and he got up and he said, I have a heart. He said, God has given me a heart for American Indians. He said, there are 500 or more tribes, and many of them have different languages, different customs. And he said, I urgently feel the need to get through them. Well, we thought every, all the American Indians just lived like all the American everybody else's. <laughs> and, uh, but our hearts were trembling, my husband and I, and we went up and talked to him, and he said, well, I'm, I'm trying to get teams together to go into the reservations and see what they need. And uh, he said, I've applied for a job doing that. And if I get that job, I'll call you because I want to send teams out for two weeks at a time in different reservations and have them tell us how best they can be reached. Well, we waited. We never saw him again, actually. And finally, he called us and he said, I did not get the job. He said, but the Lord will not leave me alone. I think you're supposed to do this. And he said, I don't have any money. I don't have any vehicles. I don't have anything uh, but a list of contacts. He said, I will arrange appointments for your team to go. And he said, you'll have to take care of everything yourself. Well, we saved money for quite a while. My husband was working for uh, what was at that time Western Electric became AT&T and so forth. And it, all of the guys and girls, most of them had jobs, and we managed to get a month off in the summer. So this was in 1979, and we started out driving across the country with just enough to get to the reservations, do what needed to be done, and go home. And we left Ohio and went as far as Oklahoma. And guess what happened? We were nowhere near New Mexico or Arizona or Utah or Colorado. And uh, the engine on our van blew up. We had 11 people in that van. We had five vehicles traveling together with all kinds of equipment and tents and whatever, and we were on the turnpike in Oklahoma, and we had pulled off at what was then a Howard Johnson's and had our bologna sandwiches in the back parking lot uh, while we were trying to figure out what to do. And somebody came and invited us to uh, their church that night. And this lady said, my pastor, she said, I told my pastor there was a, I saw a missions team that's broke down here. And he said, oh, yeah, the Lord told me they were coming. They're supposed to take service in our church tonight. I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we've never been west of Ohio. We don't know anybody. And, it, you know, you must be talking about somebody else. And they insisted, and they came and got us. They towed our van to their church. 
when we got to the church, they just gave us the service. I'd never, you know, I had to sign my life away before speaking in any place. And, and they didn't even ask us what our names were. And, but we mostly sang and did some testimonies. And uh, another man came in during the service. And at the close of, well, I can't tell you the whole story, but we wound up finding out we had a blown engine on our vehicle, couldn't be fixed, and we couldn't get another one for at least two weeks. And that would have wiped out our missions time. So we said, Lord, what are we going to do? Well, that this man that came in in the middle of the service was a... Uh, he didn't go to that church. The Lord just told him to stop by. And he said, I have a GMC Suburban, got a little carpet shop. He said, the Lord told me you really need to make this trip. And he said, so I put five new tires on it and I filled the tank. And uh, when you come back, we'll see what we can do to get your vehicle fixed. And so, complete stranger. And... We found a place that we didn't know existed in the United States. Uh, the, the Navajo Reservation, the Hopi Reservation is inside the Navajo Reservation. The Hopis are incredibly uh, Satanistic. The Navajos have two, of their two major religions are, uh, one is the medicine men, and the other is called peyote. And peyote is, uh, it's a drug that they use in their worship services. And they meet in teepees. That's a, a witchcraft thing. It is not, you know, American Indian uh, custom with them. If you see that, it is witchcraft. So anyway, we got to the reservation and we met some of the most wonderful people that are, some of them are in heaven now, but they were so, so good to us. And we met some people who wanted to kill us <laughs> and, and tried. And uh, we, we had those experiences and we went home and we said, that's a nice place to visit. I wouldn't want to live there. And were invited back the next year, and we went again, and the next year home wasn't home anymore. We knew God wanted us there, but we went back to Ohio, and we had no idea. We couldn't find anybody who thought it was important. Everybody thought we were crazy. They said, if, if you go out there, you're going to take your kids out in the desert, and they're going to die, and you're going to blame God, and you know all kinds of things. But finally, one day, my husband came home from work, and he said, I put in my notice today. He said, if God really wants us to do this, and I think he does, he'll make a way. Well, so we, there were actually three families represented. And we had an old school bus. And we all eliminated everything we had. And we said, we don't have enough. To do this and we came across the country uh, we were going across the country and got as far as Oklahoma and ran out of money and we had made an agreement that we would not tell anybody what our needs were that if God really wanted us to do that that he would supply so we got into Oklahoma and the my family that we had met on our first trip out there a black missionary family that had 12 children. Uh, they knew what we were doing, and they said, you come, we are going to pray with you, and they did. For three or four days, we were there, and they corrected me on a lot of things I needed corrected on. Uh, they did that with each one of us. They sat down, and they said, now, this is God, but you got to do it this way. And so finally we thought, we, we can't tell them we don't have any money. I had two quarters. But we've got to get out of here. And so we told them, okay, 
uh, Sunday night. No, we're leaving tomorrow morning. And they said, well, we don't have church service on Sunday night, but uh, we're going to we're gonna have one. And then the minister who was military man uh, said, we're taking an offering. I don't have an offering basket. We've got this flower pot sitting here on the organ. And so there were just a handful of people there besides us, and we all... Uh, said, okay, Lord, and I put my two quarters in. <laughs> but we had figured in order to get on to New Mexico, where we had rented a mailbox, that we had uh, we, we needed about $290. That was years ago. Gas at $5 a gallon doesn't quite meet that today. But, but we didn't have it, and we couldn't tell anybody except God. But the man got up, and he took an offering, and he brought it over to my husband. He said, the Lord says, this is for you, and it had $293 and so many cents in it. We kept going. We got to Amarillo, Texas. We were pulling the trailer. The hitch broke. We were in rush hour traffic. It was Wednesday evening, and... We had to get off one of the exits. We went off the exit, wound up in a, a parking lot with a big, nice office building that had a little tiny sign on the front door that said, Tuscosa Church. So the man came out from the church, and we said, can we park here until we get this fixed? And he said, sure, and then he came back in a little bit. This is a big really big black man with a really big afro wearing a really expensive suit and he said uh since you're here why don't you just stay with us for our wednesday night service so we didn't know what we had no idea what kind of church it was but uh, we prayed and decided to go and they took such good care of us, and the man, the big black man, had turned out to be uh, a man, I think they called him Diamond Jim or something, Brian, do you remember, that worked with Janis Joplin, for anybody who's old enough to remember that, and uh, anyway, we made it on to New Mexico, but we didn't know where we were going. We hardly knew anybody. Most of the Navajos, Navajos, by the way, if they are, if they're into witchcraft, they call that the traditional religion. And if you're white like me, you know, have no color, <laughs> that and they believe that if you touch them, they get evil spirits. So you don't shake hands. You don't do uh, any of the the normal things that you would do, unless they're Christians. Now, some of the Christians, are, fear is a big issue on the in the Navajo Nation. And we had to learn a lot of those things in a hurry. One of the things we learned was if I would say to a Navajo lady, uh, where is the church? And if the church, if, if she's standing right here beside me, and the church is right there, she's not going to move. She's not going to say anything. She's not going to point. And I think she's just ignoring me. But they point with their lips. So if you ask them something and you see no reaction, they're pointing with their lips like that. We had, we had a military man who came. Uh, his name was Colonel Bow Bottomley, and they made a movie about him years ago. Uh, but he wanted to work with the Navajos, and he came, and he was so shook up because military man, you start, you say seven o'clock in the morning, they're there at seven o'clock in the morning. He said, "They're not." <laughs> he said, "I I keep trying to tell them be there at seven o'clock," and we said, "Well, the problem is they have sheep, and they have to." get up in the morning and get all their chores done, and they get up, they're required to get up just before daylight, 
because according to their traditional religion, if you get up uh, after daylight, the gods aren't going to help you that day. You're on your own. So we finally helped him to understand that. There was one more thing, Brian. What was the, the third thing that Bo had trouble with? Do you remember? Yeah. There, there were a lot of customs that they had. And the language. Anyway, to, to make a long story. Oh, they wouldn't make eye contact with him. They, because that's disrespectful. If you look at, if you want to show respect to somebody, you look down. You're talking to them. They think you forgot. But anyway, there were all these customs that we were trying to learn. And we're also trying to learn how to depend on God one day at a time for food and for gasoline and any number of things. But eventually, we, we met a Navajo uh, DJ at a Christian radio station, and he asked us to travel with him. So we traveled all around the Navajo Nation and learned a lot of things the hard way. And finally... Uh, we were invited to go up on top of a mountain to a place where there was no facility. There was a one-room building, but there were outhouses. The Navajo Nation has lots of outhouses. Lots of places don't have water. Lots of places don't have electricity. And so we were asked to go to this little tiny church that had just started and hardly anybody spoke English. You had to have a translator. And on our, we said we would come, and on our way up that mountain, the engine blew up on our bus. Again, yeah, we, we, after a while, we've learned to pay attention when something happens, and God always makes a way. But uh, we were 12 miles from the church. They towed the bus back up in, and we lived there for almost two years. And that was a gift from God because we lived the same way the people did. Nobody, even our family, didn't know where we were. We didn't have cell phones back then. They didn't have telephone service back then. We didn't, we knew maybe three or four words in Navajo, so we had to use a translator. We didn't always know who we could trust. So we lived up there for almost two years and finally decided we needed to go down uh, into the flatlands off of the mountain and try to raise some money and start a mission. And we were snowed in for six weeks up on the mountain. We ran out of food on the last day. There was no way anybody could get into us. I stood in front of, we were sleeping on the floor in sleeping bags in this little church that was probably less than a quarter the size of this room. And uh, we couldn't get out the door because the snow was this high. And there were six of us, our family, four children, and Don and myself. And we were doing services on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And then sometimes they'd have revival preachers came in. They had no idea what they were preaching. <laughs> and we didn't either because it wasn't in English. And so anyway, the, the day that we were snowed in, uh, the last day that we were snowed in, we didn't have any food. And I had half a cup, maybe a cup of flour. And I thought, you know, I can melt snow and have a little bit of water. And I can mix that up with the, the flour. And the, the Navajos have a famous bread they make called... Uh, and it's just called Navajo fry bread. And it's a circle, and it's cooked in uh, 
grease and it bubbles up a little bit. Well, I didn't have anything to do that with. But I said, Lord, if I had something way to grease the pan on this little stove, makeshift stove that we had that we'd have to keep feeding wood all the time, if I had a way to grease the pan, I could make a piece of bread and we could have something, but there's no way that... There's no way we could survive. And I've never heard God speak to me out loud, but I have sensed words that I knew were from God. And three words came to me. You have oil. And I, I stood there, and I'm thinking, I, I'm, there's no oil. And I looked at this little makeshift pulpit they had, and there was a little tiny bottle of anointing oil sitting there. And I said, Lord, I can't use the anointing oil. And he said, read the Bible, David, use the showbread. <laughs> you know? so, so I made the most anointed bread we'd ever had. But that was it. And our boys had managed to dig a path through to the closest Navajo people. And... Uh, they had gone there and were visiting with them. And while they were there, in the evening, somebody came and brought groceries for them. And so they offered to feed my boys, but they knew that mom and dad and their little sister back in the church building didn't have anything, so they didn't want to take it uh, and, you know, us not have anything. And so finally they got up and got ready to go back to where mom and dad were. And the father in the house, who didn't speak any English, put his hand on Brian's shoulder. I think he said Brian. He knew his name. but he, uh, And he put a bag of groceries in Brian's hands. And he couldn't say anything to him, but Brian and the boys brought the groceries back. And, and it was... Uh, package of hamburger and a box of hamburger helper and a six pack of Mountain Dew which was my boy's favorite soft drink at the time and we had a feast because God knew where we were I wrote a book it's called God Knows Where I Am it's about that first year up there and over all these years we have had so many opportunities to realize that God is not far off out there someplace. He knows exactly what you're doing. He knows exactly what you need. He sees me sitting there trembling when I don't know what's going to happen next. And I know I'm... The, Got to watch my time here. But we, uh, at the end of that year, after many rescues, we decided to move into Waterflow, New Mexico. We had friends at a church there, and we thought we'd help them for a while and try to work things out to set up a ministry uh, mission. And... We got there, and there were hundreds of alcoholics, drug addicts, homeless, breaking into people's houses, getting killed on the highway, and constant, constant death. And so we found this old school building and uh, had n absolutely no money, but went to the place. There was a family living there. We offered to buy it and they didn't they weren't going to sell it but finally they decided they would and the lord worked it out somehow i can't don't have time to explain it to you here today but we moved into that building it has has about 50 rooms in the main building and then there's a a little three-story building behind it used to be a boarding school then we moved in and we started working with the alcoholics and we did that for 17 years and then uh, the numbers dropped, and we had families coming in from the Navajo Nation, which it's the size of the state of West Virginia, but 
not as many roads, or not as many paved roads, I should say. And uh, so we uh, started ministering to the families of the alcoholics that we'd worked with, and some of them had been delivered, and uh, the drug addicts. And then we had a man call us, and he said, do you all need churches out there? And I said, we need churches everywhere. And he said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, there's nothing we can do. We, you know, we're not builders. We don't have the money. We're barely surviving, but the Lord is taking care of us. And, and uh, he said, well, I am a builder, and I've been going into Mexico, and the Lord told me the Indian reservations, particularly Navajo, are desperate. He said, is that right? And we said, yes. And he said, can I come? He said, I'll work and raise money uh, for a year and get a team together, and, and we'll come and spend a week and build a church. So he did that that year, did that the next 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 year. Did that, well, anyway, 10, 11, 12 times. And then we started having people calling us and these people said, uh, we're from Korea. We have a missions team. We've heard that you might be open to that. Can we come? They came. We had people from South Africa. We had, uh, and we said, look, we, we cannot handle expenses for a team. We can give you a place to sleep. Uh, we can introduce you because you needed to have somebody who already knew the Navajos if you were going to bring a stranger in. It had to be somebody that they trusted already. And so we started doing that, and we had uh, people from the uh, Philippines. People, we had a team from Japan. And, you know, Japan is not big numbers, Christians. And... Uh, but they were, they were good. So in our mission, we had people walking around. One group spoke only Navajo. We had others like us who spoke only English. We had a, another group uh, who spoke only Spanish. And we had the 14 team members of the Japanese. And uh, that was only two of them spoke English. So we had translators going all over. Anyway, we've worked for years, and there is still so much to do, and we are facing a crisis right now. Uh, we've been, we had a, have a contract on the property we're in, and we've been paying on it for years and years, and the people that we bought it from both died. And they, their children, 14 of them, uh, are receiving on the contract. So they multiplied our monthly payment six times a month, uh, six times higher <laughs> per month. And, uh, and so we can, we're not, we've had a team come in and build an 80 by 135 foot warehouse, which is we send thousands and thousands of pounds of food and clothing and vehicle parts and building and, and so forth. But right now, we need your prayers for this because uh, the parents were friendly. The children are not friendly. However, God has never been unfaithful. When we don't know what to do, you know, the broken down car in the middle of Oklahoma, the, 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 the many, many times that we've had to face, okay, you got to have $900 this morning and it doesn't walk in the door until 20 minutes before you have to have it. We're, we're used to that happening, but we do need prayer. And we've been so blessed by the faithfulness of this church. Oh, my goodness. You know, from uh, 
the Yarbroughs years ago. They were the ones who started helping us. And uh, all uh, your ministers, pastors, even Robin coming and shocking all of us. You know, we knew him as such a formal man standing out in his cutoffs and T-shirt pouring concrete. <laughs> such, a, such a blessing that uh, this church has been. And every now and then I call and say to whoever, secretary, whatever, I don't know who I'm talking to, uh, we need prayer for this, prayer for that, and it comes. And we, we do need prayer. And so uh, my husband went to be with the Lord in January. Uh, all three of our sons and my daughter have been very active helping us. And it's kind of like this scripture that I read to you this morning. Uh, you know, the enemy has come. We've faced that many times, and so have you. But he is still the enemy, and he still is not the one in control. He, he is the one who comes and does whatever he can get by with against us. We look at the Apostle Paul and all the things that happened to him. Uh, I picture him sitting with his knees probably in mud and his back beaten and bloody and and midnight in jail singing. The jailer, other people, just, you know, probably chains. I don't know if he could even move or not. And God sent an earthquake. All earthquakes don't come from God. But that one did. <laughs> God allowed that earthquake. And nobody, nobody died. Everybody's chains fell off. Nobody took off and ran. And the jailer, who would have been murdered if he had let any of them get away, was getting ready to fall on his own sword and kill himself. And Paul said, no, wait. God's here. God is here. What we're in a difficult time in our nation, in our world. I've not seen this kind of, I've seen a lot in my lifetime, but I've not seen the way it is today because we're close to Jesus coming. We don't know when, but he, he told us we know about when, we could tell by looking around us. And so, if you will stand with me. We are trusting God to show us what to do one day, one hour at a time. He's been doing that for years and years and he's the same thing is happening to you in your lives I know that it's just a different style but we are all putting our hands in Jesus hands we are all reminded to tell the enemy he does not have any place in us he does not have any place in our families. He doesn't have any place in our churches. Sometimes we have to remind him. But our God loved us so much that he not only allowed but sent his son to be tortured to death so that we could give ourselves to him. He loved us that much. Jesus loved us that much. The Holy Spirit loves you that much to stay with us.
in you. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Let us pray. Father, we need you. We know we need you. And Lord, you've done so many little things that sometimes.